In a recent episode of Can Yes Fix It, I got donated an X58 dual socket motherboard and also two X56 77 4 core Xeons. These are actually the high clocked variants, which come in with a pretty high base clock of over 3.4 gigahertz. So what we're gonna have is eight cores in total and 16 threads and also 16 gigabytes of registered DDR3 memory. However, when I got this board in first, it initially didn't work. And so I had to give it some tech yes loving. And this time around, we uh, put it under the sink and actually washed it off and then dried it. And it miraculously came back to life. And that was a good thing because I didn't want to waste this whole combo. And now that we got it working, I'm going to put it to some good use in that we're going to be doing a whole computer build with this motherboard, these two CPUs and the RAM. However, before we do that, there is some concerns going in, and that is this motherboard has two uh, sockets on them with the screws coming out. So they're not the traditional X58 mounting brackets. And so what I'm gonna do is, since I do have two dead X58 boards around here, I'm gonna use the uh, actual pin socket holders from those and put them on this motherboard. And that way we'll hopefully be able to then mount two normal budget coolers on this motherboard. Also on top of that, since I don't wanna be really spending a whole lot of money on a really expensive power supply, I'm going to be testing out both the eight pin connectors with individual four pins, which is what a typical say 600 watt power supply will be able to do. And if we're able to do that, then we'll couple it in a whole build with an NZXT H510 and putting some RGB on this thing and blinging it out with an RX 5500 XT because I feel something like this could go well with a budget graphics card like the 5500 XT. Though that aside, I still do have to go and do all this testing, make sure everything works. And if it does work, then I'm gonna be heading down to the hardware store and getting some stuff like coolers and also a power supply for this build so we can hopefully complete it. So basically that's my cue to get in the Yesmobile. Woo! and get this crack a lacking. So on both fronts, we managed to get a success story in that we've now got holes here to mount uh, typical coolers on this motherboard. And also the two four pins individually worked in both sockets. So we'd be able to buy something like a 600 watt power supply and still get away with using this whole build in tandem of two CPUs. And 600 watts is still gonna be absolutely plenty since both these uh, CPUs aren't going to be overclocked and we're only using a 5500 XT, which doesn't use a whole lot of power in itself. Then with that aside, let's get to the store and get all the rest of the pieces that we need for this build. So we just got back from the store and I ended up picking up two of these. They're called the Arctic Storm 3. They're 35 Aussie dollars each. So I will say that the Snowman is usually my first pick. I've actually got some being delivered, but they're gonna take around another week to get here. And so I do wanna put this build together now, but also wanna try this cooler actually right here because it looks pretty much identical to the Snowman, except they've put a uh, ring blade RGB fan on. So. 35 Aussie dollars versus around 25 Aussie dollars for what you'll pay for a Snowman RGB from AliExpress. That's the price you pay, that $10 premium for not being patient times two, which is 20 Aussie dollars. Though, we got the drives here, 40 Aussie dollars for this combo here, 120 gigabyte SSD, one terabyte backup hard drive. And then we've got this power supply here. Quite interesting, because I've never tried a power supply from Gamdeas before. So it's coming in at 69 Aussie dollars, so a little under 50 USD, and it's got RGB, which is gonna glow out the bottom. And it's a bronze rated power supply, and I spoke to the guy at the store, and I said, look, how many have you sold? And he said, quite a few, and I said, have any come back? And he said, no. 
So that usually to me is a decent sign. I guess Gamdius are trying to make a name for themselves and it's got 47 amps on the 12 volt line there. So that will be more than enough to power this whole build here. And in terms of the total build, I'll put a price of USD and AUD prices up for you guys. So you can tally up how much I've paid here today for all these components. And it comes, I think a little bit over 600 Aussie dollars which would be a little bit over 400 USD. Though with that aside, let's put this thing together and see what we come up with. So we're building this PC and I realized we've come into some trouble in paradise here that's easily fixed, but it does add cost to the bill, which I'm not too happy with. But anyway, two USB ports on the rear and that's all we've got. I mean, we do have front USB out as well, but there's only one USB port on the front of this. Well, there's a type C as well, but this motherboard doesn't support type C. Though how we're gonna fix this is since there's no onboard audio as well, we're gonna add in a budget uh, FX sound card from Creative. You can pick these up pretty cheap and it's also got a front panel out audio connector. So we'll be able to hook up that front panel audio out connector just in there, which this motherboard doesn't have that either. And then for the USB ports, the limited USB ports, we're gonna solve that by adding a hub, which isn't really the best um, solution, but it is one regardless, because if you do load these up with too many USB um, devices and they're draining too much power, then it won't, the, the devices just simply won't work. But we're also gonna add in USB 3. So since this motherboard is X58 error, we're gonna be solving that by adding in a PCIe solution with USB 3. And I had to give this some tech yes loving because I found it around, it was pretty dirty. I don't know where I got this or when I got this, but hopefully it works. So we've now completed the build and we're trying to install Windows, but since there's only two USB ports, we're gonna just use the keyboard and the USB boot. But the build looks pretty good, though we've got some double trouble in Paradise in that I think the USB 3 card that I put in is causing it to have some boot issues. And so I'm gonna take that out now, but while I'm at it, I'm also gonna reroute this PCIe cable from out the bottom there where it's got that little slot. I think they'd look a little bit cleaner and also got to reseat the memory since it's only showing with 12 gigabytes of memory at the moment in the BIOS. And now we are finally cleared and good to go and ready to install our games and do some other tests. But this was actually a bit confusing in that there's a few things you need to know if you want to go down this super micro uh, x58 route and that is initially when you want to set everything up you're going to have to use the onboard vga connector and not change any settings in the bus install your windows get everything set up all your drivers install your graphics card drivers and then after that you can then go into windows and you have to uh, you can disable the onboard vga via the device manager and then in your actual display settings you can show it only on the graphics card itself because what we can see here is this vga onboard graphics is never going away it's always going to remain there and it's going to remain there in device manager too so you can circumvent it and get around it because its max resolution is like hard locked at 
768 pixels or something. It's not even like full colors as well. This thing is ancient. But I mean, that's not Supermicro's fault. They never really intended for some Aussie tech, yes, yeah, city YouTuber years later be using a server motherboard with like the latest and greatest graphics card. But anyway, that aside, if you guys want to get this all working, you've got to understand that there will be that problem where if you go into the BIOS and then you change that BIOS setting to the offboard VGA, and that will enable this then to be the main card where it boots up to the BIOS screen off the graphics card, that will then make your PC not boot via USB, not boot, um, not boot via SATA, not boot by any other devices. It'll just pretty much hard lock it. And also if you change that BIOS jumper that we showed before and you set it to disabled, that'll also disable your graphics card from showing a signal too. So the only way to get this working, as we said before, is to use the VGA connector initially, set everything up, and then once you're all set up and good to go, you can then uh, plug it off your graphics card. And what this is gonna do now is that means that you um, essentially will boot into Windows and it'll be all black before that. So once it boots into Windows, it'll then be like, okay, graphics card's good to go. And the good thing is, is our USB 3 uh, add-in card is working and also our sound card is working 100%. So this build is good to go now. It just took a little while to get there though. The reason I think it has this problem is because this legacy card here, like a really old graphics card, GTX 580 and before, they will work fine. Like you can go off board VGA and then it'll boot fine still. It's just the newer graphics cards have the updated um, V biases on them and that causes issues on a lot of these older boards. And in this case, yes, the 5500 XT with that newer BIOS and the fact that it's a newer GPU. And if you got like a GTX 1660 Super or something like that, you would still have the same problem in booting up. So this is the only way around it really to get these two CPUs on this board working on a modern day scenario. So hopefully that answers that question. If you guys are having troubles like I've had here in the studio, that's the only way around it. That'll solve it. And let's finally get these games installed and do some benchmarking. And finally, we are at the good news. After all that tinkering and all that problem sorting, we now have a setup that's capable of streaming at both 1080p and 1440p. So the first game we ran through here is Fortnite, which when I sell PCs, this is easily the most common game that people want to know information about. So naturally, I do a lot of testing for it. Anyway, going through the FPS on this title straight up, when we compare it to a 9900K, we're really only losing about 10% FPS on epic settings at both 1080p and 1440p. Though stepping it down to the pro settings, I think this is what the pros use. That's when everything's on low 100% screen resolution with a view distance of epic. We saw here the FPS picked up to 194 at 1080p and then 166 at 1440p. So the 5500 XT and this dual Xeon X5677 setup was more than capable of playing this game with even a 144 hertz monitor. And the funny thing was is that the memory on this is still only in dual channel because we wanted to utilize all that registered memory that we got in the uh, previous Can Yes Fix It episode that was donated to the channel. And if we stepped it up to triple channel, we'd probably get a little bit more FPS but also the maximum speeds of this memory and this motherboard, unfortunately, is only 1333 megahertz. So if you had some uh, faster memory, it would kind of be pointless on this motherboard since it does max out at that 1333 megahertz setting. Though that being said, we still got a very smooth experience 
And when we set it up with OBS, because we had the second 19 inch monitor, we were able to utilize this because these can pretty much be had for like 10 or $20. Or sometimes you can even get them for free because people just throw them out. And the beautiful thing about it is it has both a VGA and display port connector. And now where this ties in perfectly with this dual Xeon setup is that we have to use that VGA output as we said before when we diagnose that problem to initially start up the computer if we want to get into the BIOS. But once we're in Windows, we can disable that VGA port off the motherboard and then also uh, set it to the monitor to use the display port off the graphics card. So now once we boot up the PC, we've still got access to the BIOS. And then once we move over, we've still got access to two monitors in Windows 10. And so everything is now working pretty smooth and pulling up some of those numbers on what you can expect with uh, 1080p and 1440p on these pro settings whilst you're streaming with OBS is that we got a 146 average FPS at 1080p and then stepping up to 1440p, we got 126 average FPS and the 1% lows were actually pretty good as well. Uh, though moving it over to the CPU settings. So if you wanted to say like, look, we've got eight cores, 16 threads, it's easily able to handle a 5500 XT and you wanna change those encoding settings in OBS, then doing that we actually saw lower FPS at both 1080p and 1440p. And you guys can be the judge on which quality setting looks better. Does the AMD 5500 XT encoder look better or does the software X264 with the very fast preset look better? Let us know in the comments section below. But for what it's worth, this whole setup here is easily geared up towards playing Fortnite with smooth frame rates. So how well can this setup perform in other titles? We'll move over to Strange Brigade. We saw here 83 average FPS at 1080p with max settings. And this is with the 5500 XT. Versus the i9-9900K, we're only losing out by four FPS. So there's not really a benefit of going out and buying a CPU that will pretty much uh, cost more than this whole setup put together. And then moving up to 1440p, we saw a three FPS difference. Though moving over to Shadows of the Tomb Raider, here we saw a uh, difference of again, roughly two FPS at 1080p, where we still got some very playable frame rates with this is the max settings as well, 62 average FPS. And then stepping up to 1440p, we got 41 average FPS versus 43. So this setup right here, the Dual Xeon X5677s and also the 5500 XT does go hand in hand pretty well. Now, of course, 5500 XT isn't the best value for money graphics card out there at the moment, but it is pretty power efficient, which is probably one of the few reasons why I decided to go with this build today and use everything, because I wanted something that looked really good, but also the power consumption numbers would stay low since those dual CPUs and that big motherboard will chew up a bit more power. But here's the really good news. The uh, power meter, even while we're playing Fortnite, we only saw roughly around 330 watts utilization, which is actually really good. So there is one drawback and that is that the idle power consumption is around 180 watts. And so this was the last architecture where they had those high idle consumption numbers because after that with Sandy Bridge, they learned to drop it down a lot more and save a lot more power. But not to worry because the whole build cost really didn't total that much at all. And we've got something that honestly, I would be very happy playing games like CSGO, Dota 2 and Fortnite and streaming them with really smooth FPS. So the last thing to go over with this whole setup is the temperatures, which were actually pretty good. I was thinking I would have to add in two uh, ring fans at the front, but I realized after I started testing out the temperatures here, they were absolutely fine. The GPU was going max around into the low 70 degrees whilst we're playing games. The CPUs were uh, surprisingly in the 50 degree region while we're playing games. And even when I stress tested them with Ida 64, the max temperatures that we saw were in uh, the mid 70s. So they were very well under control. The motherboard chipset heatsink, uh, this was a little bit worrisome because usually with a motherboard like this, they're running low powered Xeon. So the strain on the chipset as well would uh, naturally be a bit lower, but I tested out the temperatures and although the heatsink does get pretty hot, it's still fine for this architecture where it was going around 60 degrees constant. So if you were worried about that, you could put a fan on it. But after those seeing those temperatures and the fact that we're in summer here in Australia, 
I really wasn't that cause for concern. Once you start going over, say, 75 degrees on that chipset heatsink, then you should start really worrying about putting some cooling on it. But for what it's worth, it's absolutely fine for now. So the best thing, though, coming out of all this is that you can hear that we're in uh, Fortnite at the moment. GPU's pretty much getting maxed out and everything like that, and the CPU's still getting strained, and the noise on this whole build is surprisingly really low. So at the end of the day, we've got something that runs games really nice, it can stream, it's also looking really good, and the noise is really low. And that's about it for this whole setup. Do let us know in the comments section below what you think of making the most of a donated motherboard with two CPUs and some RAM, getting it back to life, and then turning it into something like this. And what I'll do quickly is if you wanna do something like this with a Supermicro X58 uh, season motherboard, then uh, the problems that we came into was those motherboard sockets initially. They had the screw holes coming out, and so we had to replace them, and we were lucky that we had uh, two dead X58 motherboards lying around. We were able to use those sockets and then mount some pretty cool RGB bling-worthy uh, coolers on board. So that was the first problem we came into. Then after that, the second problem we came into was that onboard VGA setting in the BIOS, where if we turned it to the default offboard graphics, it then gave us problems where it wouldn't boot at all. And so that was the second problem to be weary of. And so the way to circumvent this is get yourself a cheap budget VGA monitor. And if it's got two inputs, then you can use the other input off your graphics card. And when things boot up, you're all good to go. It's like nothing ever happened. But the third problem we came into was when we're in Windows, that onboard VGA is enabled. Even if you disable in Device Manager, it just shows up still for some odd reason. So what you have to do is disable it in Display Settings, and once that's turned off, you're good to go. And another downside is since this is a server motherboard, it didn't have enough USB ports on board. In fact, it only had two USB 2 outs. So we did fix this by adding a USB 3 add-in, which gave us the two additional USB ports. And on top of that, it also adds USB 3 now to this system, which is the old school X58. There was also the need for a sound card since we had no onboard audio with this motherboard too. But the good thing is the option like the one we used here today, the Creative FX, that's got a 5.1 out. It's also got a front panel audio out and the audio sounds really good on this particular sound card. But then the last problem, and I shouldn't say it's really a problem, it's just the limitation of the motherboard, is those 1333 megahertz speeds. So setting this thing up is tedious, but in the end, once it all works, it seems like it's working properly. Now the Phantom Gaming NZXT H510 case, this thing is a looker. It's actually really nice. I was surprised because I thought I would have definitely had to have added fans in, but these two exhaust fans do a really good job of keeping the temperatures down. But that's mainly in part due to the fact that we have two massive coolers on the CPUs. They don't put out a whole lot of heat as we saw with those power consumption figures before. And we've got the 5500 XT, which in itself doesn't use up a whole lot of power either. I've done a review uh, of these 5500 XTs. If you wanna see that, I'll put the link up here for you guys. But at the end of the day, we've got something now that is worthy of someone who wants to become a Fortnite baller. So let us know in the comments section though, if you had this whole setup, would you do some things differently? Love reading your thoughts and opinions as always, or are you just digging what I've done here in today's video? But speaking of thoughts and opinions, we have the question of the day, which comes from Bok Torinator, and they ask, uh, should I sell my 1070 Ti and get one of these? And they're talking about the previous video we did, the 5600 XT review. I'll put the link also for that up here, where I wouldn't personally recommend, um, it'd be pretty much a side grade, going from a 1070 Ti to a 5600 XT. But basically the 1070 Ti, at least from what I'm computing all up here, even though I haven't recently tested it, it should be pretty much very similar in performance to a 5600 XT especially if you overclock it since the 5600 XT with those new V-Biases are essentially an overclock card out of the box now, you'll get pretty much similar performance. So it's not really worth it to sell your 1070 Ti and get a 5600 XT because they'll have pretty similar encoders on board for streaming and whatnot. And you'll also have eight gigabytes of VRAM versus six on the 5600 XT. But you will have a more power efficient GPU, I believe, 
with the 5600 XT. But yeah, basically not really worth it. That's just my opinion. Though with that aside, I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon and stay tuned because what we're gonna be doing in the next video is testing these two CPUs out with that elusive BIOS setting, the NUMA setting. And we're gonna see what it does to FPS. Well, I'm gonna throw in a uh, couple of CPU bound titles and see what we get if we disable it versus keeping it enabled. So if you wanna see that the moment it drops and you're not yet subbed, then you can hit that sub button, ring that bell to get the videos as soon as it drops here at Tech City. And I'll see you in the next one very soon. Peace out for now, bye.